I'd like to introduce you to our speaker today and uh, to make sure that you're aware of uh, his accomplishments and his background um, uh, in, in what he's been doing. So he holds a PhD in humanities, a master of arts in political economy, an MBA, and a bachelor's of applied science in architectural science from the universities in Australia and the UK. He's based in Mauritius and he works as an urban strategist for the Port-Louis uh, Port uh, Development Initiative. And he consults on a number of projects um, on the thematic of smart cities and on strategies dwelling um, on the increase uh, and the effect of on the role of technology in culture and society. Uh, Zahir is the African representative of the International Society of Biourbanism, and maybe you could tell us what, what that is. He's a member of the Advisory Council of the International Federation of Landscape Architects and a member of other international bodies. Um, for his contributions to society, uh, he was elevated by the President of Mauritius to the rank of Officer of the Order of the Star and Key uh, of the Indian Ocean. Congratulations on that. He's, uh, which is the highest distinct order of merit in Mauritius. And he's a recipient of a number of other awards. He's authored 58 uh, peer reviewed publications and the author of seven books on the topic of uh, the future of cities. Uh, we've been organizing, as you know, uh, a lot. Um, welcome Zaire, first of all, and uh, I'd like you to talk a little bit more um, about yourself before we start. Uh, but for those who are following us, um, as we said, uh, the last, uh, for those who came to the last webinar, we'll have regular webinars um, on different topics related at the moment to uh, COVID-19, but in the future on very many topics and the importance of science uh, to Africa's development. We're very happy to have you, Zaire, and uh, I hope uh, uh, people will enjoy this discussion, which is very critical. We've seen the impact of urbanization um, and what it means, for example, at COVID for uh, infections in rural versus urban contexts, uh, the kind of urban in Africa being different from other, uh, other continents. As well, we've seen um, uh, the, the discussion around uh, the fact that we've, we're having lo low carbon emissions and how that will change uh, it, when we go back to life as usual and what we can do to make sure that we are building in uh, green policies into uh, our policies post COVID. So over to you Zahir, I apologize. I will have to dip out for a few minutes but then I'll be back uh, to learn some more myself. Thank you very much Nathalie um, for the introduction. And um, I'm quite pleased to see some familiar names uh, in the audience. I see uh, Dr. Muna Radi who is doing excellent work on the SDG Commission for the UIE, the International Union of Architects. Um, I see uh, Sapna Nanlal and Maximilian Chong from Mauritius, both working as GIS consultants and space consultants, and um, Vedishta as well uh, from Mauritius. So I'm quite pleased um, uh, from, from this outcome, from the initiative as well, uh, Natalie, of the next um, Einstein Forum. Uh, yes, so a bit about myself. I, I'm a passionate of, um, of urbanism, of how um, inter and transdisciplinary innovation happens on the urban fabric, and also how um, different dimensions, though at first unseemingly connected, all suddenly um, impacts on the city. And when we see it as a, during those last past few weeks, past, past few months, how the coronavirus has changed our lifestyle um, altogether. And that's what I wanted to talk about today, um, how not only through the coronavirus, but major disasters in itself has changed our understanding of the, of the urban life. And this is not something new. We've known in the past numerous incidences like the Black Death of the 13th century, where in five years, 20 million people died, where at the time it was one third of the population of Europe. We know of the Great Plague of London, uh, where in the 1665, 100,000 people died in London, which in just under 18 months, and at the time representing 25% of the urban population. The Great Plague of Marseille of 17th century, 100,000 deaths, 30% of the urban population. The Russian flu, 1 million people died. And 
one which we we've for the last few weeks we've all been reading about the Spanish flu in the early 19th century, where 500,000, uh, 500 million people were infected and one fifth of those died. And it's incredible how coming out of those periods of major industrializations of civil war, of disasters, earthquakes, and so on, and how we see how different, we see strategies where different countries are embracing really urban planning, architectural, um, oct and architecture as a tool for problem solving and to come out of those situations and increasing the livability of their citizens. And uh, it is, is not uncommon in the urban discourse of those uh, situations. For example, we know of um, the Garden City, where many cities uh, embrace the Howard's Garden City plan in the early 19th century, post-World War I and post-Spanish flu, to craft garden cities, which were themed as being more air-filled suburbs, bringing some fresh air, some greens in the cities, and how those concepts, interestingly enough, augured very well through Cadbury, the chocolate manufacturing um, company, Cadbury, Roundtree, and Fry, and how those led to factory cities where ideals of green, of healthy humans were computed to being healthy humans is equal to healthy and happy workforce, which means higher productivity. And we also saw how um, cities, uh, for example, in the United States, embraced the green lungs theory of Frederick Olmsted. Um, and New York today, as we know, it's Central Park is benefiting from this and it's had a long term impact and this will most probably stay for long as now it's the secret place for New York. In the same vein, following the World War I in Spanish flu era, we know um, how Melbourne drained its Albert Park swamps to create a ma major parkland, which today is uh, benefiting the, the city. And previously it was an, a mosquito in enabled art deco regeneration uh, as a tool to not only regenerate the city, but uh, to clean uh, those areas. And uh, following the great fire of, 19, of 1666 in London, which destroyed actually two thirds, incredibly two thirds of the city of London, we know of Christopher Wren, who was appointed as the King's Surveyor of Works. And uh, he was uh, given the difficult task of re rebuilding the city and he erected 52 churches during this time, uh, during his time. And one of his major works includes the St. Paul's Cathedral, which still which stands today as one of his masterpieces. So we know of uh, those disasters, those pandemics having a long term impact of city and this one will probably not be any different. And we know how um, those planning and professional institutions are more, not only recognizing the lifelong learning, but also the life light learning practices, because today we are living in a complex society where we understand that linear reco uh, recourses are no longer uh, applicable. But it, even if it's too early today to understand the impact of the change, we can provide some fair assumptions as what to expect in the coming weeks and the coming months. Since the beginning of the, uh, of the pandemic and uh, on the 9th of January, when the World Health Organization uh, raised alarms of the situation, the Wuhan meat market where the coronavirus is believed to have originated, originated was immediately closed and inv invaded by people in hazmat suits. Those images traveled the, the world at a record speed. And two weeks later, the city of Wuhan was placed on lockdown. And rapidly, immediately after, the Hubei, Hubei province, a zone expanding to 15 cities, even including Shanghai's Disneyland, was closed. And that's incredible, because all those cities together cater for an approximate 56 million people. 
those disconnected with the outer world, with public transportation disabled and roads completely closed. And all that during the Chinese lunar calendar. At the time, this was an impressive figure because to put that into perspective, 56 million people is actually larger, larger of a population than 209 countries. So you get the scale of the situation. And what this uh, caused was an incredible reaction by the communities. And interestingly, we see cities reacted to this from two sides. One, we see residents collectively chanting slogans. Uh, at the time in Wuhan, they were chanting Wuhan Ziayu, meaning stay strong Wuhan, or keep going Wuhan. And they were chanting this from balconies of apartments. And we saw videos of this flooding social media in a spirit um, of, um, to enliven their, uh, their spirits. And contrasting with the scenes of desolation of, of the ghost cities uh, in Wuhan. And on the other side, we see impromptu acts by civilian uh, creating makeshift um, structures from bricks, uh, from bicycles, plastics, uh, anything they could see, with sign, well, they could get with signs saying no outsiders allow, uh, allowed. And we are seeing the emergence of volunteer checkpoints. Interestingly, we, we, don't, we see that governments on, uh, residents are not acting on governmental orders, but they're acting in a bid to prevent the communities uh, from the risk of uh, the virus outbreaks. And we see the natural urge of people from bunkering to further seclude themselves from the city because there was so much uncertainty as to the effects of the virus. And rapidly after, when the epicenter moved from east to west, we saw trains, cars, planes, cruise ships suddenly on a halt, where cruise ships did not have any port to dock. And it was suddenly an issue for port cities, because port cities rely on the diversity of people and from the rich area of businesses that those cruise ships bring to the city. And we saw reports of how two thirds of the world's plates were Planes, airplanes were grounded. That means 16,000 passenger jets. And this suddenly became a big issue because to park those airplanes safely was a problem. And also those airplanes um, to be idle was suddenly a huge amount of work because they have to maintain the hydraulics uh, of those planes. And interestingly, this represented the lowest uh, number of passenger passenger jets in operation since the last 26 years, impacting negatively as a result on the tourism industry. And this is quite problematic for countries like where I'm mean in Mauritius, where small island developing states rely heavily on tourism. And uh, because they are remote, um, disconnected from other places, and they capitalize on the natural resources. And SIDS in total actually generate $30 billion a year from tourism. And it declined to this scale of tourism from the grounding of airplanes uh, and the impact on Maldives, for example, which, re which uh, rely on tourism for 66% of its GDP, could see its GDP drop to 16% for the year. And but why does this mean what does it mean for cities? Such a drop in, in GDP for countries, for example, for small island developing states means less revenue for infrastructure, less revenue to inject into the much needed infrastructure to combat climate change for mitigation measures. And also this means less revenue to find finance already strenuous external debts. So this suddenly puts uh, cities and the entire countries and the economies at risk. And following uh, rapidly after, with the lockdown, the closure of businesses all around the world. And suddenly, those images that we saw previously in uh, Wuhan was a common image in most of our cities, where all of our cities were coming, becoming ghost towns. Interestingly, so we saw the emergence of new business opportunities. Businesses were quickly shifting online, shifting to online deliveries. But not all businesses could afford to do this. 
or could have the capacity to quickly shift uh, from physical to online infrastructures. And what this resulted was incredible and unprecedented rates of unemployment all around the world. In the US itself, uh, as we speak, the numbers are nearing 40 million, uh, if I'm mistaken, already surpassed 40 million in the United States. Uh, and what does this mean for cities? Previously, we know um, people were flocking to cities because of the employment op opportunities they bring. But now with cities closed, we see people trapped in high density areas, which are prone to contagion. And, uh, but the issue is cities actually remains where the healthcare sector is, where research is active, where developments for the coronavirus uh, are being undertaken. Um, and it still remains where the opportunities will be in the, in the next few years. But the economic impact, however, direct economic impact is very real and set to widen the gap between the rich and the poor. And also with the businesses unable to shift from physical to online infrastructures, we will see incredible market shifts happening on the urban realm. On the left side of the picture, you can see the, the New York Times, which is quite a, uh, a creative figure, where they resulted for the first time in the history of uh, the New York Times, a whole uh, margin on the, on the right hand side of the cover to show how the unprecedented scale of unemployment were rising. And this wasn't only in the United States. In India, on the other side, uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi announced the largest lockdown uh, of amounting to 1.3 billion Indians, ordering them to stay at home. And the same phenomenon, as we saw in Wuhan earlier, we see makeshift structures from citizens, secluding the community from outsiders. So we see seclusion, quarantine areas in quarantine cities. And even in those areas, we see quarantine areas in quarantine areas in quarantine cities. And the layers going, going up are in proportion with the uncertainty that is rising from, from those scenarios. And what, why am I talking about India here? Because the resulting uh, effect from this lockdown was incredible. Where we could see what we can call today as a great coronavirus migration of India, where suddenly we have 140 million migrant laborers who don't have anywhere to go because they suddenly cannot afford to live uh, in the city where they were in search of their daily subsidence um, that the urban life provides. With now And now with the previously buzzing city suddenly coming to a halt, what happens to their opportunities? They don't have any money. Issues of rent suddenly emerge where they don't have money to pay food or even to, to survive. So they, they don't have any other choice than to return back to the villagers. But in this image where you're, where you're seeing suddenly with the lockdown, the government took the decision to stop public transit as well. And this now puts them in a very, very difficult situation where you see the great coronavirus migration where all those people are suddenly forced on a journey of many kilometers to return back to the village. And this is quite uh, a heartbreaking story where you now see reports of construction workers which were living on those subsidence and those daily work wages, walking up to hundreds of kilometers to go back to their village. In this slide, you can see Dayaram, uh, the father with his son Shiva, who, is, who are set to walk a journey of 500 kilometers from Delhi to their village. And you see many others, others the same situation. And those people usually build the very, the very fabric of the city uh, that we call home, but often go unnoticed because those are often unregulated workers from informal sectors. And interestingly, when we look at those families of those work, uh, workers in the city, we see an 
interesting um, conundrum where you can look at the money flow. In India, $30 billion flows, dollars flows from the urban to rural side each year. And now with cities under lockdown, we can see how rural counterparts are suffering as well. So the impact of the city is very, very real on the larger uh, Indian economy. And those families do not do an easy job because construction sector is very, very dangerous. Where actually uh, the risk of fatality is five times more than the, than the manufacturing industry. And in India, where 80% of the sites are actually deemed unsafe. So now we see how um, suddenly with all the those construction sites locked down, those cities locked down, uh, we are seeing long-term uh, damages and not only the economic fabric, but also the very social fabric of these families. And with the lockdown also comes a scene which we've seen in most other countries or the empty shelves in our supermarket. Um, and interestingly, those were not only about food. Um, canned, canned food or, uh, or, or the basic items were seeing the whole industry suffering from panic buying, uh, where the 300 billion food service industry suddenly coming from a decline of up to 90% due to COVID-19. And one problem due to this from the, how do you say, from the, from cutting the ties from the rural to urban, the rural to urban ties is we saw the problem of supply chains emerges. In the US, we were reading of uh, reports where two thirds of the sales of fluid milk actually goes to retail channels. But with this link severed, now dairy farmers have, were forced to dump millions of gallons of milk, all going to waste. But food wasn't the only coveted uh, item in this pandemic. We know of masks, uh, how those were rapidly uh, going off our shelves, and also uh, how they became the item of um, um, how to say, geopolitical tensions as well. We read of a shipment of 6 million masks suddenly disappearing in Kenya. We don't really know where it, where it went. And we also see quite an interesting, um, the emergence of an interesting phenomenon. On the right here, you have a photo of uh, Ovidiu Olea. And I was reading of, of his story in uh, an article in The Guardian, where it's, it's a fantastic story, where the finance guy of a company of only 20 employees, where he was planning to buy masks for, for a small company, but he couldn't find enough masks on the market. And he saw an opportunity of, uh, of trading those masks. And he suddenly became a mask mongol in just four months. And his story is incredible where he bought 500,000 masks from, uh, from South Africa, and he thought of shipping it uh, to Hong Kong. And suddenly, uh, from 500,000, he bought 1 million, and now he's over 48 million masks, and he's now shipping to many different countries, not only in Hong Kong, but in China, in European nations. And from buying bulk masks, he, he now invested in a whole mask manufacturing machine because he now th sees that the long-term prospects, they are actually long-term prospects in this industry. But why, why am I saying this? Because this is actually interesting. We're seeing a shift in investment from other businesses to those short-term uh, commodities. And this is replicable, but we're seeing this in other sectors or city as well, where we see a shift in investment from deep property development to immediate short-term profits, short-term returns. And what does this mean for the city? We know many architectural firms uh, around the world are now seeing the projects frozen because suddenly 
The investors or developers suddenly see those as risky endeavors due to market uh, uncertainties. And if this problem persists, city, the city stops its developmental agenda. And what happens? We study, slowly fall into a state of urban decay because this not only means um, a stop or reduction in investment flows in buildings, but also in infrastructural, uh, infrastructural developments. And now we see uh, in the US, the, uh, President Trump invoked the Defense Production Act, which is quite interesting because we see he said that now uh, mask and productive personal equipment, PPEs, are now vital commodities, but not only that. He marked uh, the meat industry as well because they were seeing a meat shortage coming uh, on the market in the United States where 80%, they were expected to face a 80% shortage of milk during the shutdown. And President Trump then invoked the DPA and classified meat as a critical infrastructure. And suddenly we see factories with 45,000 workers, which were on the brink of shutdown, forced to keep their doors open and suddenly spiking coronavirus cases uh, up rapidly. Where 11,000 workers now in just three companies were reported to be uh, positive of the coronavirus. And interestingly, those meat processing plants, those factory cities in rural um, America are suddenly seeing a spike of those um, cases. And interestingly, many of those workers are often unregulated workers. So we see the same trend as in the construction industry in the India replicating itself in the meat industry. Uh, in the United States. And a parallel, interesting parallel between the two cities from different agendas. And of course, we also had strange panic buying items where in Australia, we were all surprised by the urgent need of people for toilet paper. And not only toilet paper, in the United States, we saw uh, people lining up uh, in front of gun stores and why was this happening? Because we saw the in insecurity due to the new and unknown coronavirus. People were suddenly fearing the closing down of institutes, public spaces, and the risks, uh, new and unknown restrictions for social gatherings and so on. And there was even reports that there were possible hate crimes on the rise, on the rise, and all leading to the um, to the perceived need of people to feel secure. And that's the rush towards gun stores. And even online sales for guns and ammunition were rising. Uh, where we saw a 68% uh, rise uh, for online guns in just uh, nearly two weeks. But while panic and uh, the need for safety were rising in one side uh, of the world, on the other side, in uh, Amsterdam, we saw people lining up outside marijuana uh, stores, uh, coffee shops. But also for the same reason, people were anxious and living up in uncertain times. But instead of buying guns, they were buying their medicines. And interestingly, the coffee shop culture is critical for, the, for Amsterdam, for the city, where they hire up to 5,000 to 10,000 people and it's critical for the urban economy. And even though some shops could manage to shift to online sales, others are now suffering and are on the threat of venture capitals, which means big companies, large venture capitalists are proposing to buy off those small traders to combine those to one large monopoly. And we have all this pointing up to the need and to the challenge of, of uh, global supply chains. And this is quite interesting because on one side, when China was imposing the lockdown, we saw China as the world's uh, manufacturing capital, as the factory of the world. They, they were closed 
and couldn't supply the world. But when they opened, they lifted their restrictions on their lockdown. We saw how the other side of the world um, is starting to face the same, um, the same problem. So when the factories were reopening, the consumers were in a position to buy. And this was a problem because for China, exports account for one fifth of China's GDP. And this is quite um, a problem. And we could see also companies because due to the uh, lockdowns and the regulations imposed that it was, it took longer for companies to settle an invoice for the ports. And this was a problem because what happens to companies that rely on those uh, trade of goods? And interestingly, uh, through a study of the World Economic Forum, we could see that small businesses actually have enough cash to keep them solvent for only one month. But then what happens after the one month? Interestingly, we saw that different co uh, governments around the world were kicking in with governmental aid, bailout mechanisms. But uh, this, those are now running dry. And when the cash flow dries, this will have it. We are facing a devastating impact on supply chains on those businesses uh, trading. And not only this, in the last few years, we saw a rise in what we call just in time principle, where businesses just keep enough inventory uh, to, they keep it available just to meet the current demand so that they avoid excess, they avoid uh, warehousing space, they reduce waste and they have a uh, smaller investment. But the problem with just in time is where the lockdown was affected, this whole supply chain was impacted. And again, what happens in this scenario? We see that port cities usually rely heavily on its warehousing, but now this may be reevaluated. And as the need for more resilience is being called around the world, we now see the need for agricultural resilience to keep our fridge packed. And we see the emerging calls for local scale production. Um, and this is quite important because before the pandemic, over 820 million people were already living in hunger. And we were already um, seeing the need for increased resilience for the whole supply chain and production. And now this is more important because we, we see that we need to prevent a food crisis. Before, this was a love affair between, again, the rural and the urban side, because food was produced principally uh, in rural, rural regions and feeding, uh, feeding the city. And again, with this link severed, this suddenly became uh, fragrant that we have to change the system. And keeping this link, Post-virus will be very, very expensive, now, as, as now we see it, and envi probably environmentally unsound due to the associated emissions of travel between the urban and, and the rural side. But even though if we want to move 100% um, food production locally, this will be very difficult. And some may not be totally adaptable because for the local climate and the variations, or it, it could even not be economically feasible. So a mix of those will be uh, expected in the short term. And importantly, we, if we do see the rise of rooftop farming, which seems uh, like a romanticized idea, we will see the increasing need of technology, of, agri of technology in agribusiness because we may see a rise of small scale rooftop entrepreneurs using technology not only to manage, to irrigate those small uh, areas, but also to manage several areas at the same time across the city. And on this, we come on the idea of, big, of smart cities, where in 2015, we, already, we know that the, the concept peaked and uh, with it, the concept of big data and artificial intelligence rising up. Why? because we see sudden rise of Internet of Things devices being developed and installed in cities around the world. And we know of policymakers understanding the need to gather and look at data to make more informed decisions. 
And interestingly, during uh, the early days of the pandemic in February, I published a paper saying that since we already have this rich array of information in cities, why don't we use those uh, data to, uh, to try to monitor how the coronavirus cases are, are evolving in different uh, cities around the world. But the major problem with this was each ICT corporation installing ICT networks usually come with their own set of protocols and devices which make transfer of data between them very, very difficult. And it was an important need to change this. And interestingly, in April, we saw how uh, we read of Apple and Google partnering up uh, to set up a platform where different smaller companies could plug in. And now this is quite interesting. Why were those companies setting up a platform instead of developing their own app, app applications, mobile applications? Because it was quite tricky for them. They were, they were not allowed uh, to just share data. There are lots of restrictions to data. And even if we, we are seeing legislative change at record speed, the, uh, those companies were still not allowed to plug in our personal data, even if it was for uh, to manage the coronavirus crisis. And by providing this platform, we now see an emergence of a number of mobile solutions. And not only small companies, but countries coming up with their own applications where people can voluntarily share the data. So we see the emergence of uh, quite an interesting concept where virtual geographic information sharing and the emergence of citizen science, for example, uh, coming up. And we see it as a, a trade-off, an interesting trade-off because people previously were reluctant to share the data, but now they seem to be able, they are happy to do it if there's a perceived belief that it will bring a betterment for the community. But now, just like in, in small cities where we find the issue of privacy a concern, just in this pandemic, it is still very real because what happens to all those data that we voluntarily shared during the pandemic, what happens to those after the pandemic? And this is, this is quite concerning because those companies can still profit from those data. And this is what was happening for small cities for a very long time, where we see it was a very profitable venture because uh, in 2018, it is expected that, they, they, sorry, in 2018, there was over 20 billion sensors already uh, deployed in cities around the world. And those means data and data is a new oil of this century, it means money. And in the same time, 2018, the smart city market was valued as over $308 million. And now it was, was set in three years to, boot, to really explode to, to three times that, to over 700 billion. So this is quite incredible. And when we look at those massive companies like the GAFA, Google, Amazon, Facebook, uh, Apple. During this pandemic, we read the headlines of how G Amazon's G uh, Jeff Bezos became 25 billion richer and billionaires' wealth in the United States increased up to 10% in the same time. In the same time that Americans, over 40 million Americans were filing for unemployment. So there's a quite a disparity of wealth management of money influx happening over the city during this pandemic. And this all leads to the increasing gap of inequality between, and the gap between the rich and the poor. But again, why is this important for the city? In the case, in this, it's still to remain the case of Amazon. This is quite interesting because uh, in 2018, when Amazon announced that it needed a second headquarter that was set to hire 50,000 jobs, we could see cities fighting up to compete uh, to be Amazon's ground for the second headquarter, the HQ2. And they were not only fighting, but they were providing incentives for Amazon, fiscal incentives for them to implement into the city. And this was quite unfair for existing businesses, for smaller businesses, because while Amazon was getting tax rebates, being a big monopoly and already making billions of profits per year, 
smaller businesses were suffering from this unfair competition and also from them having to pay tax while reaping uh, minute profits in comparison. Uh, and now secondly, during the pandemic, we saw how all those companies were not had to work from home. So what happens to those large expensive infrastructures in cities? Twitter, for example, a company of over 4,600 employees said that uh, the employees could now work from home indefinite, indefinitely, meaning that we, can, we reduce altogether the need for those massive uh, headquarters. And this could be quite a a uh, breath of fresh air for those cities, for those small businesses where cities don't need to line up to provide fiscal incentives for those massive corporations anymore. And this is quite interesting. And on the good note, we all read of the reports, um, emissions declining rapidly uh, in China and in uh, places all around the world. And this is quite important again, not only for environmental preservations, but 3 million people die every year from air pollution. And 80% of those live in cities. So when we already have cities which are unsafe, uh, we really need to discourage um, surface transportation. And interestingly, we are seeing that we are moving towards this, um, this trend. There was a fascinating um, report in uh, Nature last uh, month, which documented this decline in emissions, where we can see how power, industry, surface transport, public and aviation all went down drastically, except for residential needs, and which went up because everybody worked from home, but only went up slightly. Meaning that we can actually, we already have the means the, the lockdown showed us that we already have the means to change the shift to contribute heavily to this drop, uh, to these drops of energy. But now the question, what uh, happens, what happens after the, the lockdown? We do have cities around the world like Bogota, New York, Paris, and, um, and Berlin that uh, provided policies that said that we, they would be dedicating street space for pedestrians, cyclists to ensure safe mobility. We know in Paris, for example, uh, through Mayor Anne Hidalgo and uh, the advisor Carlos Moreno uh, proposing a 15 minute idea where they provided structural change for the city where each people could have, everybody could have basic facilities in a radius of 15 minutes around them. Hence reducing the need for transport again. But if not every city moved towards those solutions, what happened? We may see again uh, a trend towards business as usual, and this is quite dangerous. If we read the, the reports in the last few months, we thought that the lockdown decreased the need for energy and oil, the price of oil plummeted. And even oil futures, for example, went down to minus $37. And while this may not be representative of the physical price, it shows how oil um, is really a commodity that nobody wanted at this moment. And this is quite dangerous. If uh, governments are expected to, uh, how to say, uh, to inject back into energy in the short term, they might see this as being profitable, but this is wrong because this will be short-lived and price is expected to go back up very soon. And the problem is this is many countries uh, around the world may now see that it, it is suddenly being expensive to produce oil when it is simply not needed and countries will be forced to cut investment in those areas leading to global, lower global output of oil and interestingly geopolitical shifts. And again, if government rush to invest in oil at this moment, they will be simply tying the investments into heavy infrastructure and an unsustainable source of fuel for the next 20 years. So uh, this um, needs to be taken up, these decisions need to be taken up very seriously. And again, why is this important? for cities, because 
uh, we already, the last few years, we already saw that there was a decoupling effect. Previously, we understood that for, in order to increase our GDP, we needed to burn fossil fuel. But in, since 2016, the, this has changed actually, where the International Energy Agency announced that for the first time in hundreds of, in hundreds of years, the world was producing less greenhouse gas emissions without an economic crisis. So change was already underway before the coronavirus. And not only in, uh, in uh, the coal industry where we're seeing renewables going up and fossil fuel going down, but also in the car industry, in the auto automobile industry, where in 2017, we, we saw the market capitalization of Tesla, the giant of electric vehicles, overtook that of Ford. And this was a, a, an indicator of uh, the trend of this industry. But again, why am I saying this? Because for cities, they consume two thirds of the world's energy. So recovery mechanisms must not undo the progress that we've been for the last few years and endanger uh, the situation to go back to this coupling effect. And all this, I go up to, to this, the need for recovery mechanisms to align to SDG 11, to make cities inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. But interestingly, we've been seeing an, uh, protests all around the world, where calls of racial discrimination in the wake of the murder of George Floyd coming up in city, major cities around the world. In, uh, for example, we saw the, the incredible uh, Black Lives Matter letters Painted, painted on the road leading to the White House in yellow color, in civic infrastructure, which meant a warning for emergency, a warning for attention. And not only in the United States, in major cities all around the world, and not only calling for Black Lives Matter, but also calling for equality for all minority, minority races. And here we are seeing people braving the virus to manifest once again in public spaces in cities to call out for inequality and for the city uh, uh, and the inequality of the city host. And interestingly, this is not the only issue that recovery mechanisms need to look into. We also see the aspect that in, of inclusivity expand not only racism and discrimination, but also dimensions of poverty, crime, gentrification, education, and so on. But, and interestingly, on this front, we see commonality in different surveys where among us, we know that climate change is extremely important. But when we do surveys with residents, it usually ranks among, among the lowest on the, on, the, on the survey list. Why? Because people feel the need for housing first, for traffic, uh, for better transportation, education, and so on. But knowing that climate change is a transversal issue, and it has a direct impact on cities. This needs, uh, we need to look at this dimension as again, as a transversal issue. But we, we do have a challenge on, on this front because global policy may, may not follow rapidly. We saw the, uh, we read of the news where US, the US was withdrawing from the World Health Organization. And we see a geopolitical shift because on the same day, China pledged $2 billion to the World Health Organization. So we see uh, where countries are withdrawing, others are, are turning up. Um, and this is quite raising, uh, raising geopolitical tensions in the case of China and the USA. Because USA was calling for countries, for the UN to launch independent study on the origin of the virus, where in this case, Australia also joined in the calls but China retaliated with sanctions. For example, uh, just a few days ago, we read of travel advisory from China to Australia and suddenly impacting heavily on, their, on, their, on Australian cities. So instead of seeing global cooperation, we are seeing a rise of nationalist agendas. And this is quite dangerous because in the wake of coronavirus being a planetary scale problem, we need a planetary scale solution 
And in the case of the USA, retreating from the WHO, retreating from the Paris Agreement, uh, this is setting quite a dangerous precedence because we know that, that the USA is still chairing the executive board of the UN Habitat, which is a UN body for human settlements. So they still have a major influence on international policies for cities, even though they already made it clear that they're withdrawing from climate discussions. So th we are seeing, our, we are finding ourselves in quite an interesting uh, conundrum. And where we have already have challenges of climate change, pollution, inequity, tech surveillance, and uh, tech monopolies. And now we have the challenge of COVID-19. And we are called to respond urgently with both societal and economic challenges. And the problem here is our response will have to support livability standards, not only for the city, but also um, for, for the people, for the city and beyond, because we remember the link of the fragile link between the city and the rural counterparts. And on this, it may have to, uh, to impact on two factors. One, on the speed of which the vaccine is found, because then restrictions will be eased. And two, on economic recovery periods, because those will impact directly on business models and on the speed at which economies could uh, recover in different cities around the world. And maybe I'll stop, I'll stop here and we can take a few questions. Thank you. Thank you, Zahir. Um, thank you for, uh, for a great presentation. My name is Esther Kunda and I also work at the Next Einstein Forum and I'll try to moderate um, this Q&A session. Um, so before I go, we already have two questions in the Q&A. Uh, but before we go to them, I just wanted to to ask you a quick question around um, around the impact of um, of COVID on African cities uh, specifically. So if if we're seeing these shifts, uh, especially if you see that more cities in Africa, the cities that are uh, that have slums, that have um, informal settlements in in, in urban area. So what is the, the overall impact of, um, of the pandemic? And also, how do you propose that, um, that, that urban strategies actually, um, city managers actually deal with, um, with the, pan the post-pandemic process of this? Uh, yeah, we, uh, interestingly, we saw uh, in the beginning warning, warnings that, um, the COVID could explode in slums, but in, uh, hopefully, thank God, we didn't see this um, happening at the moment. But when we look at supply chains, it's quite interesting because slums have quite a different complexity and intricacy in terms of planning than in mm -hmm. than modern cities. They, they have their own secluded communities within community, communities, which means uh, the space that people have, the distance that people have to travel between slums, is like, uh, to, let's say to buy a particular item, is actually shorter than in a modern and planned city. Where, for example, in China, in the beginning of the lockdown, people have to queue up for hours outside grocery stores just to buy food. And in slums, we're not seeing this happening yet. And uh, so they have, in terms of this complexity, they also gain in resilience, which is quite interesting. And there's actually increasing literature on this, where we are now facing the impacts of our modernist planning. Um, uh, and we saw the damages globally. And when, we, when I spoke about the 15 minute city of the proposal of Mayor Anne Hidalgo from Paris, it actually replicates kind of the same complexity where they say that everybody, they encourage everybody to have um, access to basic amenities within only 15 minutes distance, reducing the need for vehicular um, dependence. So I think this is one actual lesson that we can learn from those slums and organic, um, if I can say, planning outcomes of uh, cities. Mm -hmm. And um, and so there's uh... There's someone who asked, um, 
so, someone who asked, Paul Mugambi asked, um, as we put recovery plans into play, it is important we sell the tide as opposed to try and normalize it to the old normal. So what are the foreseeable impacts of urban life post COVID? Yeah, uh, this is quite, when we look at those recovery mechanisms, it's quite interesting because there's now increasing debt as well. For example, mm -hmm. in um, Africa, we saw uh, in February, uh, February, March, we saw how African finance ministers made a call of up to 100 billion USDs for foreign aid, where they already they were already indebted to uh, to a tune of 350 billion dollars. And now the issue is with recovery mechanisms. We, not, we governments are not only looking at uh, recovering the let's say the losses in those last few months, but also to pay back the debts that they had. Uh, already, and this is now a very, uh, I'd say, tricky situation because the finance need um, in, with strenuous debt cycles. And the issue with that is we already saw that some countries couldn't borrow more money and they suddenly redirect their internal money flows, where instead we saw uh, instead of infrastructural developments, we saw money moving in from those developments to the health sector. And now suddenly we may see cities falling into a state of urban decay if they don't reactualize those internal, not only external money flows, but also internal money flows to, uh, to allow uh, developers to inject this money, not only in private projects, but also perhaps also provide fiscal mechanisms to encourage people to invest into the public domain. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, um, and if no vaccine is found in the near future, how are major cities, um, are there, is there any city that is ready to live with, the, with, the, with COVID um, on a permanent level? That's a question from, is it VS from Madani? Uh, yeah, this one is quite tricky because we saw, you know, Probably one thing that we one thing that we saw with this fund, uh, with this situation is we saw the word unprecedented being used at unprecedented levels, and uh, each country had some variation of their strategies, except with Sweden, which was completely different. Yeah. And um, but one commonality is we are seeing that uh, the health, uh, the livability level, the health uh, aspect of citizens is trumping economic uh, dimensions, which is quite good, actually. Mm -hmm. And from this, we are seeing interesting trends as well, because in the last few months, we saw the rise, if you, if you got that as well, we saw the rise of uh, universal income, where some people could not work, but governments were stepping in to, give, to provide them basic income. We saw also a, a rise towards a wealthy state, where in some countries, hospitals were paid and now they're free. But on the other side, we may face the, the case of investment flows again, where developmental projects suddenly face the risk of um, not only having enough money to, uh, to inject into property development, but also clients, the supply side, people not having money to buy housing or to mm -hmm. buy uh, different properties. In interestingly, in Asia, in uh, Hong Kong, for example, we are seeing the decline of housing prices of up to 20%, which is incredible. But on this, it may, it may be tricky because when people don't have money, they still need the house, but they are ready to pay less. But with the increasing inequality that happens, we may see a different scenario coming in. So it is very important, and I, I think, for the uh, upcoming few months that governments around the world look at those questions of economic inequality in cities just to prevent uh, the further widening of those gaps between the rich and the poor. Mm. And, and just to the audience, um, to all the participants, if you'd like to ask your question live, please raise your hand and then I'll give you the floor uh, and then you can ask. Otherwise, uh, I'll just go through some, some of the questions that are on the Q&A. But if you'd like to talk right now, please raise your hand and, um, and I'll give you the floor. Um, the next question, and 
so for me, um, going from your, your response, that I wanted to to ask, um, and there's someone else who touched on it in the in the Q and A. Um, as we are now moving between um, between re, like advocating for remote work as well uh, remote work and trying to figure out what what is work, uh, where is the office post uh, the pandemic. Um, what does that mean for investment in 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 buildings and in, in this uh, in this development in all these mega development? What does that actually mean um, and the impact it's going to have? Yes, um, yeah, with the work from home, we've seen, um, like in the previous slides, like some of our companies, Google, Amazon, Facebook, and, um, and Apple, were announcing work from home and Twitter permanently saying uh, employees can now work from home. But in different countries as well, like in my case, for example, uh, we are now uh, shifting to a mix permanently, uh, office and home. And suddenly the office uh, doesn't need all of the space uh, to accommodate the 100% of the staff all the time. So they save on resources and they can invest this space differently. For example, they can uh, shift to co-working, for example, providing uh, entre young entrepreneurs with spaces. But not only this, companies also save on resource, less energy and infrastructure and so on. But perhaps one interesting thing is with internet now, we don't really need, we don't really have the need to be in the same city of where we're working. And this is quite mm -hmm. interesting because we were seeing incredible migration flows from rural side to the, to the city, just be, to be closer to our place of work. And now we, we can question whether this uh, will have a long-term impact on the future of work uh, going mm -hmm. forward. Okay, uh, Sapna, you can uh, you can ask your question. Yes, I guess yes. I think it's it just feels like in something where everybody is looking at. Um, I know. Um, so I'm currently I'm based between London, UK, and Mauritius. Um, and I know since um, I've been picking up on my network since 2017. Um, a lot of questioning around around you know mega cities at least i've seen from here because uh, in the, it's this, these conversations happen directly in direct relation to um air pollution um people were getting you know concerned about raising sort of families or just or just living in a in a mega city so um i'm just thinking about how um, yeah, the coronavirus conversations have kind of got maybe catalyzing some of these questions, these conversations. Um, you know, reading someone about someone like Rem Kulas talking about mega cities are not, you know, are not the only way. Or I think he's calling for a shift to a rural, to a more rural, lower density kind of living. I'm, I'm just wondering the community of urban planners. If that's that's those are kind of major signals or minor signals that are being picked up, but I guess that's something that can't be answered like in five minutes or something we'll see over the long in the long run. Yeah, um, thank you, Sapna. And this is quite interesting uh, for the audience. In, in, usually, the term mega city is a city uh, over ten million people, and this is quite interesting as well because. Again, for those uh, areas, the recovery mechanism is very important. Like Sapna mentioned, the air quality is already uh, critical. Like for example, uh, when we saw the slide in China, where a lot of those mega cities are. And uh, in terms of energy, this is quite interesting because due to the COVID-19, we, we are expecting an 8% drop in carbon emissions this year. And this actually represents six to eight times more than the 2008-2010 recession, which means really we are in a unprecedented times, like uh, we're reading a lot around. And what does this mean now for, uh, for recovery mechanisms? Like Satna mentioned, she's from the UK, and the UK is quite an interesting um, example on this. 
when we were looking at the coronavirus, the, in, the economic impacts of the coronavirus, we, we were quick to equate it to the Great Depression of 1920. But in the UK, for example, to go back to the indicator, the previous indicator of the, of the situation for the UK, we had to go back past the Great Depression, past both world wars, and up to a point to 1706, where Queen Anne was uh, in power. So uh, faced with those harsh economic realities, that's a danger. That's a danger here because governments will be will be tempted to take drastic decisions. And the problem with this is usually governments plan on the uh, political mandates, which is usually five, four to five years, because they have to get reelected. So the decisions need to have short term, uh, how to say, short term turnover. But the problem is they turn towards oil at this point where the price is low. Before their power plant is already built, they would, the price is already higher than renewables. And the danger is really here where they need uh, governments around the world in mega cities and other cities as well. They need to really not only take into account the immediate future, but also the foreseeable trends to ensure that we don't go back into the previous business as usual uh, scenarios. Thank you. Gameli, uh, do you want to ask your question next? Um, yes, thank you very much. Um, so access to water seems to be very important when it comes to controlling coronavirus infections. And as you may know, we have challenges with WASH in many African cities. So are there any examples of scalable interventions we've seen on the continent in the COVID area, in the COVID era, and if not, what ideas may be helpful going forward? Uh, sorry, the, the question was on wash, I didn't get it. Yeah, I'm interested in the area of water and sanitation in terms of mm -hmm. um, the fact that um, there are challenges with access in many cities and um, whether there are like examples of good interventions put in place to help with sanitation facilities in order to help to control coronavirus infections in African cities? Or are there any like ideas that can be very helpful in that area? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. I'm not, uh, to be honest, um, quite knowledgeable about the WASH specifics, but I did see uh, interesting architectural interventions coming up from entrepreneurs across the continent to provide uh, scalable solutions uh, for businesses and also, interestingly, some scalable solutions in slums, which was um, uh, fascinating to see. But uh, to take the example, but it can be quite a tricky situation now if we explode this to the factory size setting. Um, and not only from the slum, if we go back to the case of uh, the US, where President Trump invoked the DPA, Defense Production Act, in the meat industry, they were trying to save the meat industry by forcing those employees to work. But then again, they did, even then they didn't have the resources to ensure that all the workers were properly, properly equipped and uh, safeguarded, from, uh, safeguarded from the virus. And uh, this shows how fragile, again, the supply chains are on the production of those PPEs. Now we did see an interesting also uh, a proportionate rise in the manufacturing of masks, but again, this is quite a tricky business uh, venture and scenario because not all masks are um, equipped and health graded to prevent those coronavirus because for those masks, the surgical mask and the N95 mask, they need a special type of fabric, a material, which is actually non-woven fabric. And you can't really get this everywhere. We're only uh, usually, they, they only have access to factories manufacturing the mask itself. You have to be a regulated buyer. So this is quite a tricky situation and there's no clear answer for, uh, which I can give you right now, because I think for me, this is quite linked to the supply chain and they need to break this monopoly in the manufacturing of those PPEs as well. Thank you. Konate, do you want to go to go next? 
Konate? Uh, we cannot hear you. Okay, so uh, while... Hello? Yes, now we can hear you. Please go ahead. Okay, uh, I was talking to the relation between pollution and transportation because we have seen in this coronavirus, the pollution rates, uh, rate has been decreased drastically. So I don't know how the country's traffic manager and the government can allow some workers to be able to have partial remote work uh, even after the coronavirus, because, uh, because we have seen that it can, uh, it can decrease the pollution rate, and what are the new policies they can make? Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, indeed. Um, from the report of Nature, Nature Climate Change, I read that um, since the global lockdown was instituted, where 3.4 billion people were in forced confinement. Surface transportation has indeed drastically dropped and actually has nearly halved uh, the emissions generated during this time. But now the issue is, again, how do we pursue this on the long term? I gave the examples of cities of Bogota, New York, Paris, Berlin, and so on, where they were reclaiming spaces for pedestrian and cyclist to enable uh, safer individual mobility. But the changes for them to become permanent and uh, to become, sorry, long-term and permanent will uh, depend on the, those recovery mechanisms as well. You know, this uh, is usually linked with the problem of long-term problem of cars in cities where they, they say that we, our roads are congested, congested, so to solve the problem, we add one more lane. But the problem is when we add one more lane, then people buy more cars. And, the, and then we go back into the vicious loop of, um, of uh, private vehicular dependence. But the problem is not only adding, is not actually adding lanes, but to relook at this problem through a different angle, not linearly, but from an ecosystem problem. Why do we, and we ask ourselves, why do we actually need cars? Can we change the system? Do we need cars to, um, to travel from home to work? Then how can we live closer to work? How can we provide fiscal mechanisms to allow the, the densification of areas and also allow people working closer to their homes? Because densification is not enough. We need to, to look at the economic factors as well. People need to be able to afford those areas. And this is quite an interesting question because let's say, let's look at port cities, for example. Port cities play critical role to, to sustain the entire supply chain that we saw, which is important um, right now. But the problem with port cities is we also have waterfronts, which, is, which are uh, on, on those, in those cities. And those waterfronts usually have very high prices where people working in those port cities cannot afford to live on those waterfronts, to, which are near to their place of work. And this is quite a vicious cycle because we're pushing those people away, further away, and forcing them to travel to work, and then forcing, again, uh, emissions rise in the city. So we need to, to look at those differently and create wealth differently, and this is what actually possible. But we need to look at it at a whole ecosystem uh, level. And also by doing this, we can top, uh, capitalize by creating a more inclusive, uh, and crazy society because then people will be happier and also we'll have a mixed uh, mixity of people not only creating seclusive uh, communities for the rich and for the poor and this, is, this will be more um, let's say socially and both socially and economically valuable solution um, Maximilian had uh, had uh, had a question yes yes uh, can you hear me Yes. 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 Thank you, Zahir, for your presentation, and uh, it was really interesting. And you provided, you painted a really good picture of how supply chains have been affected globally. And in this context, for African cities, I wanted to bring into question the current uh, 
African economics and how we could think about restructuring the current economics. And I am thinking about uh, informal sectors and internal economies in the context of international trade because um, informal, a majority of the population works in the informal sector, right? And that makes it very difficult to have a solid tax base, meaning less public funds for public projects and improving local infrastructures. And then this has also an effect on the economic of the country because these informal trades and uh, services they are a shift of resources internally inside the country, whereas in other countries there is a, a bigger exchange of capital. And in terms of exchange of capital in many African countries, we have seen that it has mostly been about neoliberal practices of outsourcing cheap labor or mining for resources that would be used by big corporations. Uh, elsewhere in the world leading to more global inequality. So in, in this context, I was wondering what, what are the incentives and what are the possibilities for African countries to use this moment when global supply chains are frozen and the world is questioning global supply chains and coming up with self-subsistence strategies like the DPA. Is there anything that uh, African governments and policies could implement to encourage self-sustainable and self-subsistence practices in Africa. Yeah, thank you, Maximilian. Um, yeah, this is actually a very interesting question, and I, I would break it into two. Uh, first, about the informal economy. Uh, indeed, this is quite a both a tricky and a an interesting situation because informal economies contribute immensely to the city, but the, uh, they provide service, but they do not contribute economically to the fabric, which means they do not economic, uh, contribute economically to the infrastructure in which the businesses are usually tied on. For example, uh, in uh, West Africa, we know uh, in Benin, they have the market of Dantokpa, which is the largest market in Western Africa where uh, which contributes enormously over millions of dollars per day of trade but only in the informal sector nothing goes back into the infrastructure or into the actual infrastructure of the market itself and this is quite challenging for the government of benin there because people are traveling from other countries as well to trade in this place so how do we get those money flows from the informal sector to the formal sector one uh, interesting aspect that we are seeing on this front is that when government are turning towards uh, universal income, because during in the lockdown, many businesses couldn't work and also including the informal sector. Like in the case which uh, you read in Mauritius, where now informal sectors have to register themselves to be able to be allocated those, um, the, in, the basic wage, the universal income during this uh, lockdown period. By registering themselves, they now become a registered trade owner or a registered entrepreneur. So it's a sort of interesting shift where people of those informal workers are voluntarily coming forward in the name of survival to register themselves, knowing that in the long run, going forward, they will have to pay uh, the relevant dues to the state. Uh, so this influx of, uh, of capital is quite interesting in this sense. Now, how will this be uh, involved practically in the long run is quite uh, is another scenario. One uh, interesting part on this is example um, in, of um, mobile money, which is known in Africa, where we, we know of informal, uh, again, the informal sector using those uh, those um, forms of payment, perhaps instead of getting them to register, to register to the government, the solution is again just to look at who has a bank account and where the money flows are going in and then register the owners of the bank accounts. But I'm not sure how in terms of 
practices can be done, but I think that we're going towards an interesting shift to this end where everybody can then contribute to the uh, economically as well to the urban infrastructure. The other part of the question, which is again interesting is, you mentioned how um, collaboration or export and supply chain could be done within our, uh, African countries. Again, when we look at this from the geopolitical context, we know that many African countries actually import and export substantially to a large scale to China, while they could encourage those um, imports within Africa itself. We note, for example, countries like um, South Sudan, uh, Angola, uh, Morocco, Tunisia, and so on, having a high export dependency to not only China, but also European Union and the, and the United States. While those bring ex, um, how's it called? Uh, valuable currency back to the country, the imports on the other end, we have to ensure that those are from the African continent itself. So we reduce not only the cost, but uh, also reduce the cost of the items which you can export. But the problem with this is a frictionless trade. And I think President Paul Kagame is doing an excellent job on this front with African uh, inter Intercontinental Trade Agreement. But how uh, this will be accelerated through the pandemic, I did not really see uh, the conversations going. Uh, I did not read about the conversation at the moment. But I think in post recovery mechanisms, we'll, we'll be seeing this on continental level, surely in the future. Yeah. So Zahir, before we, we wrap up, one last question. There's uh, Samuel Baker who asked, um, what would be your advice for the future design of an African city in light of social distancing concept? And that will be our last question before we wrap up. Sorry, can you repeat this? Um, what, what would be an ad your advice for the future design of, um, of a city in light, especially an African city, um, in light of social distancing concept? Uh, I've been reading quite a lot about uh, designs with social distancing, but I, I personally believe that this will not stick around, around for long because once the vaccine is found, then we may soon go back to some sort of uh, usual behavior where we can gather in crowds and, and so on. We've been, we did see some interesting and let's say innovative architectural designs where restaurants or people are eating in bubbles and so on. And um, we know right now we, were, we are having crowd restrictions on numbers, on gatherings in public spaces and in uh, other public uh, buildings. But I don't think this will really sustain in the long run. Okay. Okay, so um, I think uh, we'll wrap up here. I don't know if you have any last word, but uh, thank you, Zahir, for, for the presentation. Uh, thank you, Esther. Maybe as a last word, I would say um, we are really living in excited, uh, exciting times. And I think it's very important for every one of us to really advocate for sustainable and inclusive recovery policy mechanisms. Because in those difficult times where really the economy is being strained, uh, governments will be quick to react towards probably linear thinking, but we need to really encourage that uh, we do this towards a more sustainable, cohesive, and uh, inclusive manner. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, and uh, good, ev uh, good evening to everyone, and please follow our social media to know uh, our next guest in, uh, in two weeks for the next webinar. Thank you very much for everyone. Hi. Uh, uh, so here, this is Natalie. Thank you so much again. And uh, the the recording will be available in, in uh, either tomorrow or by Monday, as well as uh, you'll be sharing your slides. Yes, Sayer? Yes. Perfect. Thank you so much and have a good evening to everyone.